Hi, this is Mark Birch with quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. Oh dear, oh dear, John Donne, it makes it very hard to support you or defend you when you produce a uh, poem like Woman's Constancy, uh, because superficially at least the title seems ironic. The whole poem seems to be devoted to a woman's lack of constancy or faithfulness. So once again, we're in the realms of Donne's misogyny. But once again, I am going to try and defend it in the sense of it satirising the kind of persona who present these kinds of views. If he does this much more though, I'm not going to be able to keep defending it. So let's have a look at the poem itself. Now thou hast loved me one whole day, tomorrow when you leavest, what wilt thou say? Wilt thou then antedate some new made vow, or say that now we're not just those persons which we were? Or the oaths made in reverential fear of love and his wrath, any may forswear. Or, as true deaths, true marriages untie, so lovers' contracts, images of those, bind but till sleep, death's image, then unloose. Or your own end to justify, for having purpose, change, and falsehood, you can have no way but falsehood to be true. Vain lunatic, against these scapes I could dispute and conquer, if I would, which I abstain to do, for by tomorrow I may think so too. So, Dunn presents a poetic voice who claims that their lover will produce arguments to justify their faithlessness before concluding the poem by stating that those arguments might in fact be his own. So the Volta subverts our expectations, hopefully. Um, the form of the poem is a dramatic monologue. And so, given that that denies the addressee a voice, it's the perfect form for the representation of a passive female recipient. It could be argued that the addressee, rather than being his lover, is actually himself. The poem could be said to function as a soliloquy that articulates the insecurity and inconstancy, being the key word, of a naive and immature male, rather than being actually a criticism of a female. There's cynicism that's evident right from the first line with the use of the adjective whole. The word conveys a sense of entirety and completeness, yet it refers to just a single day. So the poetic voice's hyperbole renders the comment sardonic. And now thou hast loved me one whole day. But the poem's composed of many interrogatives. We get this tomorrow when thou leavest, what wilt thou say? And that conveys a sense of uncertainty. However, the declarative that precedes that, what wilt thou say, reveals that the poetic voice is certain about some things. In this case, they're certain that they will be abandoned, conveying the insecurity of the poetic voice. The majority of the poem consists of the poetic voice hypothesising the arguments that his lover will use in order to free herself from this brief relationship. Ostensibly, a woman's lack of fidelity is assumed in that the speaker posits the range of arguments that she will undoubtedly employ. We've got to remember, she hasn't employed any of these. These are the ones that the poetic voice himself is constructing and then placing into her voice. The possibility of the woman being committed to him and staying with him and being faithful isn't even considered. Wilt thou then antedate some new made vow um, is the first of a number of words or phrases from the semantic field of the law. Uh, Dunn's producing an argument rather like the logic games that he would have enjoyed while studying the law at Lincoln's Inn. And what we have here, first of all, is antedate, which is to predate a contract. The claim that the poetic voice is making is that the woman might argue that in order to escape any kind of commitment to him, she'll claim that she's already betrothed to another. That vow will be antedated in the sense that she'll have created it at this time, but backdated it a bit. So she's just making it up now, this relationship with this previous person that she's committed to, but she's setting it in the past as if she's already committed to it so that it can function as a kind of legitimate excuse in order to reject the uh, relationship with the poetic voice. 
John employs a series of anaphora through the use of or. Uh, the frequent introduction of those different possibilities reinforces the sense of uncertainty that is already established. But alternatively, it could also convey the range of excuses offered by women, symbolising their inconstancy. He also presents this seemingly paradoxical argument that we are not just those persons which we were. He believes that the woman could have claimed that they've changed, despite it just being the very next day. And uh, we can see the tension in the paradox there between the, the now and were when such a gap is so infinitesimal. Love is personified and presented as a fearful figure, um, or that oaths made in reverential fear of love. So the claim is that oaths that are made under pressure, under duress, can be renounced, they can be forsworn. So it's another legal argument that develops the sense of the poetic voice testing the arguments of a reluctant lover within the framework of these kind of legal arguments that Dunn would have been trained in. The next argument is based on the idea that death leads to the end of the marriage contract, or as true deaths, true marriages untie. So lovers' contracts, images of those, bind but till sleep, death's image, them unloose. Um, so the premise is unlikely to be disputed as true deaths, true marriages untie. You know, um, death will untie a marriage. If you're married to someone and they die, you're no longer um, in a legal bind with them or legally bound to them. But Dunn already establishes the flaw in the argument that's going to follow by repeating the word true. The lover's contracts are images of the marriage contracts, just as sleep is an image of death, but it's not a true image. So they're false parallels that are implicitly mocked through this interrogative form that's been adopted. Um, given that death and sleep involve this kind of loss of consciousness, it was a relatively common Elizabethan conceit to compare sleep and death. Macbeth does it frequently. Uh, so for example, you have um, downy sleep, death's counterfeit. So the idea presented is that if death marks the end of a marriage, sleep marks the end of a lover's contract. As long as we're accepting these parallels that uh, you know the poetic voice claims exist. So if the poetic voice has slept with the woman after their night together, she could just use this to justify the end of their ties to one another. It would be as if uh, one of them had died. They are no longer committed. They've now slept, so they are no longer committed. And the poetic voice concludes this list of hypothetical arguments with the paradoxical concept that given the woman intended to change and to be false, the only way to be true to herself would be to be false to him, to be true to her duplicitous nature. Hence, you've got this paradox, falsehood to be true. Um, that repetition of falsehood uh, emphasises Dunn's focus on deceit. Um, deceit lies at the heart of this, um, although who's deceiving who is the interesting question to ask about woman's constancy. The final quatrain dismisses the hypothetical arguments imagined by the poetic voice. Now, criticism of the originator of the arguments is offered. Uh, vain lunatic. Uh, the vanity of madness could be a consequence of the belief that they can do better, abandoning their, their current love. But ironically, the poetic voice displays such vanity in the claim that he could produce a counter argument to each of these efforts to escape if he wished. And here, really, I think we get the sense of the immaturity of the poetic voice. It's conveyed in the claim that he could win against these arguments if he wanted to, but he can't be bothered. I abstain to. There's an arrogance there that's so often coupled with immaturity. And then he concludes with that shocking Volta, for by tomorrow, I may think so too. So it seems as if the poetic voice is inconstant as the woman that he's been imagining. 
But we've got to remember that these imaginings of what the uh, woman would say in order to get out of commitment are just those arguments of the poetic voice. They're the ones that the poetic voice constructs and then imagines a woman saying. So by the end of the poem, when he says, I may think so too, we know he's already thought these things because those of what have formed the basis of the poem. And that's why um, it's possible, even though, you know, everything sounds incredibly misogynistic, it's possible to read this as actually a condemnation of those kinds of misogynistic views. The woman has no voice in the poem and the male voice is imagining these arguments, but they are the arguments of the male character. They are not the arguments of a woman. They are not justifications of woman's inconstancy, but actually of man's inconstancy. So we'll end by taking a look at the structure of the poem. To begin with stanzas, well, it's one 17 line stanza, an unusual verse form, and it could complement the sense of a stream of consciousness from the poetic voice. More interestingly, that consistent stanza could structurally represent constancy, something that again is ironic given that uh, this is potentially about inconstancy. So it mirrors the irony of the poem's title. In terms of the meter, well, largely iambic pentameter, but some tetrameter, some trimeter, some dimeter, and that creates a jarring rhythm. Um, there's no sense of regularity there, and it mirrors the poetic voice's sense of anger and frustration, also mirrors, mirrors once again that sense of inconstancy. The rhyme scheme, a, A, B, B, C, 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 D, E, E, D, F, F, G, G, F, F. Whew. Um, you've got that sense of connection, but it's an awkward and inconsistent one, which again complements the nature of the relationship described. There is a connection there, but it's an awkward and inconsistent one. And then finally, form the dramatic monologue. We only hear that single voice that allows Dunn to play around with the reader's response to the poetic voice and allow them to judge the poetic voice on the basis of the way in which they condemn themselves through those their words. Okay, take care. Ciao.